Football is a great game, but uh, there's an inherent risk of injury. As far as the cervical spine is concerned, there is no such thing as a freak injury. You're trying to block a guy, you're trying to tackle a guy, he's moving. Young people sometimes think that uh, they're immune to injuries, and they're not. Play fake, Green, Reggie Brown, popped by Junior Rose Green, he's down, the ball is out. They're calling this a fumble. They That's sure are, Reggie line Brown line. is still down. On any given Friday night, millions of Americans pack stadiums just like this one to enjoy one of our national pastimes, high school football. Then we finish the weekend with our favorite college and professional teams. It's a culture in our country. It's a sport we love, but it's also a sport that carries the risk of serious and sometimes catastrophic injury. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Jerry Punch, a physician and college football commentator for ABC Sports and ESPN. And over the span of my career, I have seen it all. And while catastrophic injuries in football are rare, they are life-changing. And with this video, our goal is to look at how improper contact can lead to head and neck injuries and to provide tips and information to reduce the risk of injury. Now, while it's impossible to eliminate injuries in football, there are steps you can take to help protect yourself. Axial loading is a mechanism responsible for cervical spine and spinal cord injury in football. When the head is up, the neck muscles absorb forces through controlled motion protecting the spine. However, with head down contact, the cervical spine straightens. In this situation, the muscles cannot absorb the energy input. Axial loading is a mechanism where the player makes contact with the top or crown of his helmet. The head is acutely decelerated, the momentum of the body continues, and the spinal column and spinal cord are literally crushed between the decelerated head and the continued momentum of the body. The spinal cord, however, doesn't heal, and the resulting paralysis is permanent with a profound negative impact on one's lifestyle and ability to earn a living. The most common mechanism for catastrophic brain injuries in football is helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision. The player that's most at risk in a typical helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact is the player that doesn't see the hit coming. So if your eyes are on a ball to catch it and somebody lines you up and has their neck rigid and tense and you have your neck nice and loose and not in a shock absorber position, and you get drilled by this other individual, you're the one that almost always is going to have the head injury. And still on his feet to midfield, someone lost a helmet.
The person that's greatest risk in the tackling act is the defensive back, whereas the individual who's at greatest risk in the act of being tackled is, of course, the ball carrier. From 2002 to 2005, these injuries have increased from 6 to 9 to 12. This is the first time since 1990 that these numbers have reached double digits. What we want players and coaches to realize is that each incident of head down contact is actually an exposure to catastrophic injury. Those most subject to these injuries are defensive backs. Nineteen seventy nine, uh, in a summer practice, uh, one of my defensive players went in to make a tackle, made the tackle with the crown of his head, uh, hit another helmet to be exact, torqued the helmets, and uh, broke his neck and became a quadriplegic. Catastrophic head injuries fall really into three different categories. First, deaths due to brain injury. Secondly, a brain injury that leaves permanent neurologic deficit. And then the third category is a brain injury that has neurologic deficit for a period of time, perhaps weeks, months, but then eventually there's complete neurologic recovery. Uh, obviously, using that helmet as, as a weapon, as a, a blow spearing, uh, it, it puts the, the recipient at risk. Uh, he's, he can get hit with a, an object going at a high rate of speed and a great deal of force in one spot. Well, the chance for catastrophic head injury increases as the momentum speed of the two individuals that are going to collide increases. The single play that puts individuals at greatest momentum is the special teams play, the kickoff, and to a certain extent, the punt. But more at risk is the person who is making the contact. And that's the guy who gets hurt more often, the concussion, the uh, neck sprain, uh, God forbid, the paralysis. Um, you know, that, that person is at tremendous risk anytime you hit with your helmet first. Of the brain deaths in football, about 40% of the time, the head down position can be identified. That's poor technique. One of the most dangerous collisions in football is when a defensive player makes a tackle below the waist. Research has found that tacklers are much more likely to drop their head into the um, axial loading position um, when they're trying to get lower than a ball carrier. As you lower your body to get in position, uh, the natural thing is for the head to go first. Primarily because it's instinctive. Um, players want to protect their eyes and face from the collision, so it's natural to try and duck your head in order to accomplish that. And that's something that you just have to work on and drill, and, and it's just something to overcome that natural tendency to lead with your helmet. Keep that head up, see your target, and that's going to force you to lead with your shoulders. The important thing to remember again is if you initiate a blow with your head, you're at risk of concussion. If you initiate a blow head down, you're at risk of a serious spinal injury. Over the years, we've come a long way in reducing the risk of injury. Whether through rule changes, coaching techniques, or through advances in protective equipment, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the incidence of these injuries since the mid-1970s. But there is room for improvement. Over the past 10 years, between 4 to 12 football players a year have been paralyzed, and that is still too many. And for those unfortunate athletes, there is no surgery or rehabilitation that will repair that damage. In an effort to eliminate these injuries, football must acknowledge that every incident of head down contact puts the player at risk of a serious head and neck injury. The good news is, research and experience have shown that proper contact techniques can reduce that risk. Coaches are primarily responsible for teaching and seeing that their players practice safe heads-up football. 
The goal of every collision should be to initiate contact with the shoulder while keeping the head up. You're still going to be able to deliver blows. You're going to be able to ward off blows. The key point is that you never put your head down and you never strike with the crown of the helmet, whether it's blocking or tackling or running with the ball. You do not do that. What we need to happen is for coaches to increase practice time on correct techniques of initiating contact with the shoulder and training them almost so that it becomes instinctive to keep their head up at contact. You're never too young, never too old to work on fundamentals. We work on tackling drills, we work on blocking drills all the time, even in professional football. How you teach an individual to tackle will determine in a game how under pressure that individual tackles. If we drill it that way and in our tackling drills, in our contact work, in our blocking drills, we just emphasize doing it the right way, keeping your head up, then you can get that done while you're practicing. And it doesn't have to be a special part. It should just be part of the natural flow of, of all our drill work. The correct fundamental, head up, shoulder down. That's the correct fundamental. I know in college football and high school football, it is illegal to initiate contact with the helmet or with the face mask. The new rule was a very important signal sent out across the world of football that we are now making sure that you understand that you tackle with your eyes able to see what you are attacking or what you're tackling. If officials enforce the current head contact rules, this would go a long way to reduce the occurrence of these injuries in football. I think one of the unique things about this penalty is it's actually designed to protect the tackler. Typically with this type of injury, it's the defensive player that's initiating the hit. So the purpose of the penalty is, for the most part, is to protect the defensive player. It really doesn't matter what position you play or where you are on the field. Offensive player, defensive player, special teams, uh, the, the object of collisions is to uh, deliver a blow and to come out of it uh, in great shape. One of the most important things we'd like to see coaches do is to acknowledge that unintentional head down contact also poses a significant risk to their athletes. And the best way to do that is to really emphasize keeping that head up, see what you hit, and hit with your shoulder. If you're not being taught that correctly by your coaches, ask them to teach you the proper methodology for tackling and for running with the football and for blocking. Your safety is at stake. Most coaches, officials, and players have never witnessed a catastrophic head or neck injury. And realistically and hopefully, most never will. But regardless of the probabilities, we must all recognize and respect the risk involved and implement ways to reduce that risk. Let's put the research to work for you. Bottom line, when the shoulder goes down, the head comes up. On behalf of the National Athletic Trainers Association, thanks for listening and learning. I'm Dr. Jerry Punch.